Well, coming up now, we're going to have Dr. Frank Beckwith uh, talking about another very important uh, topic, the truth about abortion. Dr. Beckwith has a Ph.D. in philosophy. He also has a, an M.A. from Simon Greenleaf in Christian Apologetics. He's a lecturer of philosophy at Simon Greenleaf and at Whittier University. And uh, would you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Beckwith. Like t if they touch each other, do I blow up or something? Or, okay. Captain, the matter and the antimatter. I, I learned that from Star Trek. You can't mix antimatter with matter. It's, oh, you know, it's not staying on. Is this what there? Okay. It's gravity. Okay. All right. Great to be here. Uh, uh, I'm glad that I was invited. And the, the title of my talk is The Truth About Abortion. Uh, sort of a kind of a, a vague title, I suppose. Uh, but I think it's an important, uh, an important title for what I'm going to be talking about. And that is, I'm going to talk about... What I mean, America in America today, we, we debate all sorts of things. Uh, abortion, of course, uh, is is one of the most hotly debated issues, probably the most hotly debated issue of the last twenty or thirty years from a moral point of view. But it's an issue that, for all the talk about it, it rarely ever gets debated on its merits. And, and, and I'll explain what I what I mean by giving an example of something that most of us are aware of just from recent uh, history, and that is the Republican National Convention. How many of you uh, saw that on television? I, I thought, you know, when, when Elizabeth Dole was talking, I, I was looking for an 800 number to buy whatever she was selling. I thought it was an infomercial. Uh, I evidently made, was mistaken. Actually, she was quite wonderful, but it reminded me a lot of one of those infomercials where, you know, Cher is sitting there with her fake friends, and they're talking about hair color or something, <laughs> something like that. I mean, it had that sort of... Uh, uh, take to it, but uh, before the convention, um, there was a big talk about the, what was going to be in the platform for the Republican convention concerning abortion. And uh, four years ago, 1992, I was a delegate from Nevada. I taught for seven years at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas and was very active politically. And and uh, I remember at the time I was given a copy of the Republican platform, and. Uh, Towards the uh, end of July, I thought, well, I'm going to pull this platform out and actually read what it says. You know, one of the things that, uh, that most people don't do uh, is they, they, they don't read exactly what's under, under dispute, whether it's the Republican platform or, or the Constitution or, 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 or some legal decision. People typically just rely on the media, uh, their portrayal of what it actually says. So I pulled it out, and the thing that fascinated me was that there is no abortion plank in the Republican platform. Now, I know that sounds kind of a, like a weird thing to say because there was a lot of talk of it. Uh, and what, what, I, what I mean is, if you, read, if you read the papers, they say that in the Republican platform there is a call for a constitutional amendment to prohibit abortion. You've heard that probably zillions of times since uh, the end of the 92 convention. It's not there. You know what it calls for? It calls for a human life amendment that would protect all human beings regardless of venue or level of development. Now, that of course, I think, implies some prohibition of abortion, doesn't it? But the, but the platform does not actually say abortion is prohibited. Now, why is that important? Why is that? So some people say, well, that's kind of a minor distinction. Well, it's fundamentally important because what's doing the moral work in the abortion debate is not the fact that people are having surgery. What's doing the moral work is the nature of the entity that, that is killed in the abortion. That's why the people who wrote the Republican platform back in 76, and they've pretty much kept the same language since then, understood this. And that's why they wrote it the way they did. In fact, if you look at what section in which this plank uh, w was published, it was published in a section that dealt with general human rights. 
In fact, the beginning talks about Lincoln's stand against slavery, and it goes on to talk about women's suffrage and other, other issues involving individual human rights, and then it includes the unborn. And only later on does it talk about prohibiting federal funding of abortion, is abortion mentioned. But it is never mentioned in the section that calls for constitutional amendment. Now, what I find fascinating is that you never heard anybody, with the exception of Gary Bauer once on this week with David Brinkley, talk about the nature of the platform. And, and, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, of, one is most people don't read it. Secondly, can you imagine actually a discussion on a major talk show about the nature of the fetus? It, it, it never happens. I mean, suppose for an, it, for an issue as volatile and as important as everyone acknowledges and as controversial, nobody ever debates whether the fetus is a human person or not. And of course, as, as we know, and I think it'll become clear as I move on to the lecture, that ultimately is, is what's doing the moral work in the debate. In fact, Justice Blackman in Roe v. Wade said that if uh, those, uh, the state of Texas, which was defending its law that prohibited abortion, could show that the fetus is a human person or a human being or human life, depending on which, which way you state it, then the other side's case collapses. I mean, it's clearly acknowledged in Roe v. Wade that's doing the moral work. Now, I think that there's a shift in that thinking, and I'm going to talk about that later on this morning, that, that I think if you look at a lot of recent pro-choice literature, uh, pro-abortion literature, especially in the legal community, there's a shift now away from discussing fetal personhood to a, to a new type of thinking that says it doesn't matter whether the fetus is a person. Now, this is, uh, uh, I think, it, it's something, an important development that we ought to recognize. It's not as predominant as you think, but you find it in some of the leading thinkers for the other side. Uh, I think immediately of Lawrence Tribe in his book, Abortion, the Clash of Absolutes. There's a whole chapter in there where he defends this view. He says the Supreme Court ought to get away from trying to resolve the question whether the fetus is a human person. Perhaps they should grant it and say still abortion is justified. And he provides an argument for it. Now, I know that sounds outrageous to most people, but it's out there, and it's an important argument, and I think it's something that uh, pro-lifers have to wrestle with. Uh, the reason um, um, I bring this up about what's doing the moral work is because the way in which people argue about abortion in public today is absolutely appalling, in my, in my view. Uh, I've been on a number of radio programs uh, since my book, Politically Correct Death, came out three years ago, which deals with the abortion controversy, and everybody who they've pitted me against does not want to talk about the central issue of abortion. What they want to talk about is how virtuous I am, that's, I find that fascinating. The first thing that I often hear is, is, is I, the first thing is either you're a man, right, which is an interesting observation. Uh, you know, thank you very much. I have my shield of testosterone. Thank you. You know, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I, I had one, one woman called up on this radio program and she said, you're a man, what do you know about abortion? And, you know, my, my real name is Francis. So I said, and that's what it says in the title of the authorship of my book, so I said, how do you know I'm a man? I said, what? Well, how do you know I'm a man? I said, I'm, I'm, at, oops, I'm, I'm, at ho I'm at home talking on the telephone right now, being broadcast on this radio program. You're at home calling up. You've never seen me. You know how do you know I'm a man? So you have a deep voice. Oh, I said, so does Brenda Vaccaro. <laughs> right? She's not a man. Right? And she started, she started to get upset. She was screaming. And typical woman caller. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's just a joke. That's just a joke. <laughs> Good point. Good comeback. <laughs> I do the jokes here. That's right. That's the rule. No, uh, so but, but what, what my point was to try to stress to her that really the issue is not who's giving the arguments, but the nature of the arguments. And, and, and finally she conceded that and the host of the show was laughing. And, and what, what typically happens, that's one way uh, that, that, that people try to avoid the issue. The other is to talk about the virtue of pro-lifers. How virtuous pro-lifers are. I had a, there, there, a couple of years ago, I, I was reading a, a newspaper, and, 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 and what's her name, Dear Abby, or what's the other one? Her, her, Ann Landers, their sisters, uh, um, 
and uh, they uh, it was one of those columns and they, re they reprint this column I, I think every five or six months or every every couple of years there's this one letter that gets republished that says you know if these people who protest abortions would just adopt the children that they that they that they don't want aborted then they would be better people and we would take them seriously well of course that that first off is, is not always true I mean many pro-lifers do adopt the children and many of them work in crisis pregnancy centers and uh, for years I've lectured for CPC and 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 I know a number of my friends who have donated money and time to these organizations so in terms of the accuracy of that that's false but even if it were uh, e e even even if even if she were right that pro-lifers don't do enough that doesn't mean abortion is not homicide <laughs> it's, it's a totally separate issue it's one thing to question someone's character, it's quite another to say that their arguments are flawed. For, for, for example, uh, in a debate that I, I had back at, at UNLV back in 89, I had a debate partner, um, a, um, a fellow who was a, a graduate student at the time at UNLV in ethics and policy studies, and he was pro very strongly pro-life, and we were challenged, in fact, uh, this, this debate was set up by one of my colleagues between both of us and, a, and an attorney and a social work professor on the issue of abortion. And the social during the towards the end of the debate, there was a question and answer period, and they had people walk up to the microphone. And uh, uh, one of the questioners looked at us and said, "Well, why don't you adopt the children that you don't want aborted?" And then all the you know the purple shirt people in the audience, yeah, yeah, you guys, you know. And so David, who was my partner, said, he said, "I have three children," and he, and he does have three children. He said, "I." I'm going to execute them at midnight unless you adopt them. If you don't adopt them, am I justified in executing them? And the woman said, no, because they're children. Well, then why is abortion justified if other people don't want to adopt the children? And she said, well, it's different. Oh, so then the real issue is whether the fetus is a person. Whether pro-lifers want to adopt the children isn't relevant. That doesn't mean it isn't important, but in terms of a, the truth about abortion, in terms of what we're arguing about, the central focus, the real focus is whether the fetus is a person, not whether pro-lifers are virtuous people. And I, that's why I don't like to argue about that. I had um, uh, I had one um, one fellow uh, I was debating from the Bay Area in L.A. in, LA, in San Francisco, um, and he, he was a, he was a Methodist minister who was. Um, Head, he worked for the National Abortion Rights Action League. He's like the meanest Methodist minister. <laughs> right. Who was a mountain man? No, I just threw that in there because it's Dr. Dams. Um, and he, uh, he, he, he starts out by saying, well, you probably, you pro-lifers, is that you, um, you, uh, you believe in capital punishment and, you know, you say you're pro-life. That's inconsistent. And that was his opening statement. And, and I responded by saying, well, first off, you don't know my views on capital punishment. I said that there are some pro-lifers who are for it, some who are against it, for, for different reasons. Some are against capital punishment because they come out of the, the peace churches. Some, some theologies are, are against capital punishment. I don't, I don't necessarily think their theology is correct, but they're pro-lifers when it comes to abortion. Others are... Uh, oppose uh, are oppose capital punishment not because they oppose it in principle because they think our legal system is flawed in some way and that the wrong people are getting killed so I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why people oppose or favor capital punishment and they're interesting and I'd be delighted to debate that issue but we're here to debate abortion I don't know if you know this but we were invited to debate abortion not to debate whether I'm consistent in my views I, you know what? I, I'll tell you what. I am inconsistent. I'm wrong about capital punishment, but I'm right about abortion. So let's argue about that. <laughs> See, the, the problem is everybody wants to talk about everything else except abortion. I mean, it is incredible. Um, e even if, I mean, you, I received a piece of literature from a candidate who was running for office who said, my opponent is anti-choice. Now, I don't... But the word abortion never appeared. Anti-choice. I called the guy up, and I said, 
I said, now what do you mean by anti-choice? Well, this person is against a woman's choice. I said, well, choice for what? And he, it took him like five minutes to finally say the word abortion. I mean, it just, it was incredible. And then I went on to ask him, I, and I knew his uh, politics in other areas. I said, so you're in favor of, I said, no, let me get the other thing. You're in favor of a woman's choice, right? Yeah. So if a woman has a tree growing in her backyard with a spotted owl on it, she can cut down the tree because you're pro-choice. Right, because you believe that she's got a right to make choices about her life, including cutting down trees in her backyard. No, I said, so you're not pro-choice. So she, let's say she owns a business and she wants to pay people less than minimum wage. And you're for that choice. No. She says, so let me get this straight. You are in favor. You're against virtually every choice in this person's life except for abortion. So if this person owns a business, and, and, and let's say this person wants to rent a room in her home, uh, but she, a homosexual couple comes by, wants to rent it, you think that she has to rent it. Uh, yes, that would violate their rights. Uh, so, so let me understand this. She has no rights to do anything in her private life except have an abortion. See, what, what's going on here is the use of rhetoric that is absolutely, incredibly disingenuous. They're not pro. You know, the only people who are really pro-choice are libertarians. I have greater respect for them because they're consistent. I mean, they, they don't believe that the state should have any jurisdiction in people's lives whatsoever. And, and, at least, and I don't agree with their views on many things, but at least they're, they're intellectually consistent. And, and, and you, know, we'd have, you have to argue with them on a different level. But the, the point is that, that the use of language today uh, tries to avoid the nature of the choice itself. Another uh, misuse of language has to do with uh, the use of the word tolerance when it comes to the abortion debate. This is one of the most frustrating aspects uh, of, of debating abortion. Uh, immediately if you say, well, I'm, I'm opposed to abortion rights, I believe the fetus is a person, and therefore the state has an obligation to protect all persons regardless of where they may live, uh, so I think that, that abortion ought to be prohibited by law. And that's you know, and somebody responds, well, you're intolerant of other people's views, you're trying to force your religious beliefs on others. And uh, you'll have people typically go on and say, you know, I'm pro-choice. I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't have an abortion myself. Right, but, or, I, you know, I, I, but I don't think I should force my views on others. This is an attempt to sort of have a neutral position. It's like, I, I'm not pro-abortion, I, I don't believe that it's a good thing. But on the other hand, I don't want to force people. See? And whereas you want to force people. So you're intolerant where I'm to- whereas I'm tolerant. Okay? That's how the, t- the argument goes. It's a very popular argument. It's an argument that you often hear by politicians. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago uh, in Las Vegas, and I wish I had brought a copy of it. I'd for- I forgot to. Uh, I wrote a letter to the editor about this. It was right after this guy John Salvey had, had killed people in an abortion clinic in Boston. And... and I think what he did was absolutely wrong, so I'm not advocating what he did, but as a, to sort of show the, the, the absolute stupidity of the argument I just presented, I wrote a letter to the editor that was, a, it was uh, sarcastic, it was a parody. Now, I underestimated the intelligence of people in Southern Nevada, which is not a difficult thing to do. <laughs> and uh, I'm from there, so I can say that. It's like your own mother. You can make fun of her, but if other people do, you got to beat them up. Uh, so uh, what happened, uh, I wrote this piece to the letter, uh, letter to the editor. Began by, I began by saying, I'm personally opposed to shooting abortion doctors. However, if... Uh, I said, uh, however, if somebody believes it is within their cultural tradition to shoot abortion doctors, who am I to make that sort of judgment that it's wrong? I don't believe that my sanctity of life ethic should be forced on others who believe that perhaps shooting abortion doctors is consistent with their own deeply held religious beliefs. And that's, I signed it. So I said, so so I remain moderately pro-choice. I had letters to my, I had a my fa- faculty meeting, uh, my chairman said he got so many phone calls and letters saying that they cannot believe that a person teaches at UNLV who believes it's okay to shoot abortion doctors. I mean, they, I had a, a friend of mine who works for Planned Parenthood for public relations there. She no longer works there now, but she called me up and she goes, I don't get your letter. 
I mean, I was just amazed at this because I thought, but th that's how strongly instantiated the rhetoric is that people can't even step away from it and reflect on it. I mean, it's so much a part of the, the worldview that they don't even think of it's something to even think about. And uh, eventually I had to explain it to some people. I had a doctor write me, a physician teacher at University of Nevada Medical School who's actually pro-life who wrote to me and it was said, I cannot believe that you defended this view. That's the problem with our society, this political correctness stuff, and I can't believe you're espousing it. I had to write the guy back and explain to him, and he called me, he said, I'm really embarrassed. You know, I, I didn't get what you were trying to say. Because it's so much a part of our culture, people can't even see when you're making fun of it. I mean, that's kind of scary. And getting, getting back to how do you respond to this type of argument? Well. Uh, one way that I've responded to it is to ask the question of the other person uh, because uh, along these lines do you believe the fetus is a human person that ought to be protected and if they say no then you say your position is not neutral you see if I were let me give you an analogy supposing I was back in the 19th century and I said I personally would never own a slave but if you want to own a slave, that's fine with you because who am I to make judgments about your own personal morality? And I would, and I'd say, see, I'm not pro-slavery or anti-slavery. I'm just simply pro-choice on the issue. You would immediately recognize that that's not a neutral position because it's implying what that slaves are not human persons; that they're property and they can be owned. Now, once once that's sort of flushed out and explained, you realize it's not neutral. It's a position. It's saying slaves. These certain group of individuals are not human persons. That's a position. So when somebody says, I believe that the government ought to allow abortions, ought to allow fetuses to be killed, you are implying what? Fetuses are not the sort of beings that ought to be protected by the state. That's a position. It's not neutral. It's not neutral. And yet it's framed as if it's neutral and not... Not often do people are people forced to defend their position when they when they take it. Uh, the media uh, typically do not ask tough questions to pro-choice uh, candidates for office or politicians. I don't think it's because the media is intentionally biased. It just never crosses their mind. In the few cases where they have them, uh, where uh, it, it crosses their their mind to even inquire to even ask the question. It's like, to them, it's like they're colorblind. It, it, to ask them about what's blue or red doesn't even, I mean, is, is, they don't even see it. Um, the number of times that I've lectured on this, in, in fact, in, in, where I've had audiences where there have been some people in the media, I've had people come up to me literally saying, I have, this is incredible stuff. I've never thought about it this way. And to me, that's a shock, but then I'm going to have to tell myself that once that well, people have never really thought about uh, this stuff in much detail, I mean, this is, this is pretty typical. Plus, when you write on it and talk about it all the time, you sort of make the mistake of projecting your own knowledge on the people, and that's a, that's a dangerous uh, thing to, to do. But the point is that when people talk about this, they talk about everything except for abortion. I'm pro-choice, I'm neutral, I'm not trying to force my views, but never is the question of the moral nature of the act even up for grabs. And part of the, 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 I think, the, the, the brilliance of the pro-choice um, public relations machine is, is, is this very thing, to not talk about it. To not talk about it. They'll talk about everything except for, except for the nature of, of abortion.